So uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, Be the Solution to River Pollution. Um, it's part of uh, the Rediscovering the River Column program. Hopefully some of you are familiar with it. It's a 10 year ambitious program started by Watford Borough Council. Um, and I work for Gramwick East who are helping them manage the community engagement and the environmental monitoring side. Um, so there's three years of community engagement and this is a part of it. So raising awareness of environmental issues um, as well as things like wellbeing sessions, engagement with schools and a whole host of other things. Um, so Gramwick East um, as a part of the Rescom Rivercom programme have worked with Viola before we did a poster competition about uh, single use plastics um, pollution in the River Colne and that sort of thing. Um, and they then the winners have their stickers up on bins along the River Colne, which was a really nice programme project that we run together. So that's really successful. Um, so just a few housekeeping rules. Please remain on mute um, just so that there's no background noise and we can hear Sheila nice and clearly. Um, we're going to do questions at the end of the presentation, so please put them in the chat function so you don't forget, and then we can address them at the end once Sheila has um, done her presentation. Um, but without further ado, here is Sheila, and she will introduce herself and uh, the presentation. Thank you very much, um, Emily. Thank you for the warm welcome. So my name is Sheila Chohan and I'm the Education Communication and Outreach Manager for Veolia and I'm based in Watford. I deliver environmental communications, education and outreach on behalf of Watford Borough Council and I mainly work in campaigns and policy to create behavioural change to help improve the recycling performance as well as the uh, improving the environmental landscape of Watford. And I'm really pleased here to be speaking and raising awareness on this topic of rivers and plastic pollution. So a little bit about Veolia. Veolia are the UK leader in environmental solutions. We offer services and expertise in the area of waste, water and energy management, um, whilst building a more sustainable future. As a global organisation, our work focuses on delivering simple but very innovative solutions to preserving natural resources, reducing pollution and overall protecting our environment. So what's coming up on today's session? So I'll be speaking mainly about these topics that you can see here with some opportunity for some interaction. So please make yourself familiar with the chat box facility, uh, this feature on Zoom, which I'm sure over the last couple of years we're probably stick to death off Zoom as it is already, but please make us familiar with, self, with that facility because I'd love to hear from you. So let's begin with um, how it all started. Let's talk about rivers, how it all started. So all rivers have a starting point where water begins to flow. And this source is called headwater. The headwater can come from a rainfall, or a snow melt in the mountains, but it can also bubble up from groundwater or from the edge of a lake or even a large pond. So you can see from this photograph here, this majestic big beginning of a river. So this flowing body of water um, that is smaller than a river is called a stream or creek or a brook. And when one stream meets another, they merge together. And the smallest stream is known as a tributary. It takes many tributary streams to form a river. It's a word that I can't say it properly. So um, excuse me if I do say it incorrectly. I'm sure one time I at least will say it in the correct way. So a river will then grow larger. And as it collects water from all these many tributaries, here it is again, um, along its course. Now, um, the river in that way has this erosional power, the erosional power of rivers can be absolutely immense as it gathers momentum and it can form geologic wonders like the Grand Canyon. The water that flows in rivers is fresh, meaning that it contains less than 1% of salt. So rivers still carry and distribute important salts and nutrients. It does that because it can support plant and animal life. 
And for this reason, some of the most biodiverse habitats on our planet can be found around rivers. Now, it's said that collectively scientists have all estimated that the rivers in the world carry about 3.6 billion metric tons of salt from land to the ocean each year. Fast flowing rivers can also carry pebbles, sand and salt. And as the rivers begin to slow down, as in a wetland, these sediments then sink and build up to form deltas. So the rivers that flow, overflow their banks, um, also deposit sediment in the surrounding floodplain. These deltas or floodplains are very highly fertile agricultural zones that offer absolutely tremendous value to the surrounding people. So just to give you some context, today, farmers in the floodplain of California's Central Valley produce approximately one third of the vegetables and two thirds of fruits and nuts consumed across the United States of America. That's quite big. The great majority of rivers also eventually, they do flow into a large body of water like an ocean, sea or large lake. And the end of the river is called a mouth. Now, a wise man once said that the greatness of our nation is rooted in our rivers. So let's try to explore that a little bit more. So I'd like to ask you why you think rivers are important to the people and the planet. I did say this was going to be interactive. So now's your point. Now's your point to shine. So, yeah, the question is, why are rivers important to people and the planet? So please use the chat facility and Emily will read them out. Or I can read them out, Emily, or do you want to? Um, no, I can read them out. So uh, someone's put provide drinking water, uh, immunity value, water transit, green corridor, um, provide water for growing food. So some really good answers here so far. Um, all life needs water to survive. Yep, definitely true. Um, it's very important for local wildlife. Um, life, yeah, another great answer. Is there any more we can squeeze out of people? A few more answers. So I think, I think that's all the answers for now. Um, I'll, I'll put mine in. Um, so mental health benefits. So I think walking by a river is really calming and soothing. So nature has real um, holistic properties, I think. Um, yeah, so I think... I think that's everyone's answers for now. Yeah. So, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, there's some really, really good ones there. And I'm going to just run through some of my own. Um, and here are some of the reasons why rivers are important. And I'm sure some of you can, can um, you've probably already seen this, um, but I will repeat it. So fresh, clean water, it's, I think it, it was mentioned here, fresh, clean water is essential for humans and for nature to survive. I think Rachel B mentioned that we need it for survival. So rivers are precious sources of fresh drinking water uh, for people across the world. And when the rivers are so badly polluted by industry or if they're unevenly distributed by poor water management practices, it can really be the case of life or death. And this unfortunately does happen across the world. Moving on, another reason. Um, freshwater habitats account for some of the richest biodiversity in the world um, and rivers are, are, are vital, vibrant ecosystems for many, many species. But even in the UK, over three quarters of our rivers fail to meet required health standards and it faces multiple threats, putting a much very increased pressure on the diverse wildlife that call our beautiful rivers home. And this can be from kingfishers to otters to water voles, natterjack toads, and even the brown trout. 
People also depend on rivers for their way of life and even their livelihoods, from fishing to agriculture. And the way we manage our waterways has a direct impact on people's lives. So although we use, um, moving on to the next one, although we use um, the use of planes, um, which can transport um, people and goods across long distances in very little time, we still do need boats and rivers for these purposes. So the use of our waterways to transport goods have somewhat declined from the 1800s until the 1950s. But since then, it has um, rising steadily since then. So some of, the ring, some of the increase in these methods has been in a complete response to increases in traffic congestion. Um, and some are also due to environmental concerns. And there are some companies are developing some very much innovative ways to use the natural rivers that flow through many cities to deliver goods and services. For example, did you know that in London, the River Thames is now used by supermarkets to deliver goods from their distribution centers to their stores. And this saves an estimated about, estimation of like 350,000 kilom kilometers of roads every year. Now, some of you might remember, I think it was last year now, last year, back in March, you might remember the largest container ship that was ever built. It was more like a sideways skyscraper, to be, to be honest, uh, rather than a boat. But it got stuck in the Suez Canal for six days. And this created a, a traffic jam, if you like, in the waterways. It created a traffic, traffic jam, which meant that um, no other boats could pass by and the implications or the consequences for that was was that worldwide shipping completely froze and it costs nearly 10 billion dollars in trade a day so you might you might look back and think yeah my amazon delivery was it wasn't delivered on time it was prime but it wasn't delivered on time it was probably because it was on that shipment right there um, and those shipments kind of look like the, the boat that you can see here, but it's it's much larger. So rivers can all be used can also be used to provide hydropower, which is an important renewable energy source that is now being increasingly used as an alternative to fossil fuels. Hydropower harnesses the energy from flowing water to, to electricity. That's what hydropower is. So hydropower is not a new invention. In fact, we've been using it in various forms for hundreds of years. So can anybody guess how we've used hydropower? Again, if you can just put it on the chat facility and Emily can just read it out. Uh, so someone spent milling wheat into flour, uh, yeah, flour production, mills, yeah, very good answers coming up. Yeah, fantastic, yeah, exactly. The best example of an older method of hydropower is the water mill, uh, which uses a water wheel, which is placed in the flowing river, and it powers a mill um, that, could, that can then be used to grind things like flour. So nowadays, most of the importance of using renewable energy, um, such as water, has become very acute. And why is that? It's because of the rise of climate change. However, some countries such as Norway and Switzerland now rely almost exclusively on hydropower to provide um, their electricity needs. And I believe that we have still got some work to do. We get in there, but there's still some work to be done. Moving on, river valleys, plains also provide fertile soils. Farmers in dry regions irrigate their cropland using water carried by irrigation ditches from nearby rivers. Now let's talk about a river closer, I guess, to my home um, and uh, a project which Emily, Emily um, from Groundwork East are working on, and in particularly in Watford, we've been working on a project called Rediscovering River Kong, which basically means trying to um, um, infuse the communities around the River Kong to understand, appreciate, and interact 
in a better way um, with the river itself. So little, let me talk to you a little bit about what River Colne is. Well, River Colne is one of the 224 chalk streams in the world, and most of them are in the southern half of England, with a few in northern France, I think, in the River Somme. River Colne is a tributary of the River Thames. Uh, remember what that means? Um, and just over half of River Colne's course is in South Hertfordshire, for those that have, um, that ha that have joined us from there. And also around the 1930s, the River Colne was a very popular spot for families and they used it to bathe and to swim and they also used their boats for, for leisure up and down um, that particular river itself. And moving on, another reason is um, even though the River Colne is, is a chalk stream and it's, and it's quite beautiful, but not enough of our chalk streams are protected. In fact, only 12 out of the, the 224 that I mentioned have protected status. Chalk streams are actually the planet's rarest habitats and 85% of them are found in England, like I said. Some of our most beautiful rivers are chalk streams. Their clear water comes from underground chalk aquifers and springs and it flows across flinty gravel beds, which means they're ideal habitats for lots of wild creatures like otter, water vole, uh, kingfisher and even salmon. Now, chalk streams um, have been the embodiment of the tranquility of the English countryside and we've had our great writers and poets in the past in our English um, literature that have spoken about chalk streams in such beautiful ways. For example, Kenneth Graham in Wind in the Willows, he unfolds around a chalk stream, Wordsworth, Rupert Brooke and even Tennyson express their love for chalk streams. And we have even a Sir John Betjeman who wrote of one chalk stream, which is the Kennet's chalk stream, and he described it poetically as when trout waved lazy in the clear chalk streams, glory was in me. So it invokes so much emotion to be around chalk streams. So I suggest that you get yourself near to the nearest chalk, chalk stream with a um, pen and notebook and see what feelings erupt. However, beneath the chalk stream, uh, beneath the surface, not all is well. Over three quarters are actually failing to meet the required health standards. And they're facing a multitude of threats, including physical modification, over abstraction of water, pollution from sewage work, septic tanks and agriculture and also non-native invasive species, as well as climate change. Now, climate change or global warming, which is, it is actually triggering more and more heat waves, that in turn, it is drying out the streams. The threat is now becoming a very major concern. Um, the Met Office in, themselves have recently said that over the next five years, there was now a 40% chance that a global temperatures will reach 1.5 Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And this is the upper limit that climate scientists want to set for the warming of our planet. And like I said, in recent years, these heat waves have increased the number of chalk streams to be drained dry in many places. So there is an issue. We do have a global issue. Um, as we already know, fresh ecosystems are absolutely essential for human survival, like it's been pointed out. It provides a majority of us um, for drinking water. Now, these ecosystems, these freshwater ecosystems, they are home to more than 40% of the world species, fish species. Despite their value and importance, many lakes, rivers, and wetlands around the world are being severely damaged by human activities. And they are declining at a much faster rate than terrestrial ecosystems. Now, more than 20% of the 10,000 known freshwater fish species have become extinct or, or are imperiled in recent decades. Now, we know that there are emerging programs worldwide to protect our freshwater habitats, including planning, stewardship, education and regulation. 
Now, from this global issue, I'm going to focus on one particular issue, which is plastic pollution. So over, we know that over 300 million tonnes of plastic is produced every year for use in wide variety of applications. So if you can just for a moment now, look around you, look around where you're sitting and just name five things that you can see that that is actually made from plastic. I mean, maybe you can actually just put it on the chat facility and um, Emily can just read it out or just one or two things. So we've got pens, credit card, phone case, cup, computer, mouse. Um, it's like Martin said, I can say crisp packets are nearby me. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a fan, phone cords, laundry baskets. Yeah, lots of that. Keyboard, mouse, USB adapter. So yeah, a lot of computer stuff. Uh, inhaler, yeah. Conditioner bottle. Um, yeah, lots of things that have been suggested. Okay, so, so like, like I just said, over 300 million tons of plastic produced every year, but at least 14 million of plastic end up in the ocean every year. And plastic makes up about 80% of all the marine debris found from the surface waters to the deep sea sediments. However, um, it's not looking great because the plastic production is forecast to more than double by 2050. And this is from 308 million tonnes produced in the year 2018 to 756 million tonnes, which are anticipated in the year um, 2050. So it's only going to get worse, actually. So my question to you is, how does plastic end up in the ocean? So again, I'd like to open it out right now and um, let's hear some of your answers of why you think, how, how you think, or how does plastic end up in the ocean? Uh, rivers, so yeah, very good suggestion from Sandy. Yeah, transported by rivers, discarded fishing nets, road runoff, tourism, yes. Lots of uh, yeah, boats, uh, fishing, ships. Yeah, some really good suggestions here. Sewage. Uh, yeah, littering. I think the photos of people all, all congregation on the beach and there's just lots of litter left after that that obviously gets washed away by the tide. Um, yeah, some, some airborne as well. That's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And they're all correct. There's, there's no wrong answer there at all. Um, I'd like to move you over to this to look at to look at this map. Um, so look closer to your screen. <laughs> so this this map has actually derived from the work which is carried out by the ocean cleanup. Some of you might have heard of them. They are a non profit organisation then what they do is some amazing work. They develop and scale technologies to rid the oceans of plastic. And their research sheds new light on where and where, how much plastic flows into the oceans via rivers. Their study shows that a thousand rivers shed almost 80% of the plastic pollution. So you can see from this map, um, and you can see from the key there, um, where it's, you can see the, where it's quite um, red, I guess, is, um, I have to look on the map myself properly, but you can read it there of where the main contributors of plastic pollution, where they do actually lay, um, lay wor worldwide. So rivers, like I said, um, they are the sources of plastic in the oceans. And the ocean cleanups findings indicate that ocean plastic pollution is caused not just by the big rivers, but also by number of small and medium sized rivers as well. And the main drivers for the likelihood of plastic, plastic waste reaching the ocean is precipitation um, and wind 
to mobilize, you know, to move the waste along. There's also land use and terrain slope, which is a big factor. For example, the resistance for plastic to be transported. There's also the distance to the, the nearest river and to the ocean. So the longer the travel distance of plastic of plastic waste, the lower is the probability that it will reach the river or ocean. For example, if a country is landlocked, then it's going to take much greater skill for it to find its way to the river. So examples of, um, of, um, uh, of places where it's easy to be transported is tropical islands have ones which have abundant rainfall, they have short distances from land to rivers and much shorter distances to oceans than being continental rivers. So these new factors lead to evident concentrations of plastic pollution in many countries. And these countries I'm talking about are the Philippines, Indonesia, we're talking about Malaysia, Dominican Republic, throughout Central America, while large continental countries such as China and India are still very high on this list as well. As I spoke about before, the regions with low, relatively low prob probability of becoming problem areas are landlocked, landlocked countries, arid areas with little wind or those behind thick forests. So low probability is caused by much longer travel distances that the plastic needs to cover with increased chances of the, the rubbish somehow being trapped, like I said, and examples of regions with the low polluting numbers are Central Africa or even Western China. So I'd like to now um, show you a little video of the great work that, that is being conducted around the world, especially by the ocean cleanup. So if that video can just be played right now. Thank you. At the Ocean Cleanup, our mission is to rid the world's oceans of plastic and Part of that is to prevent more plastic from, from reaching the oceans. With our research, we found that rivers are the, the arteries that carry the plastic from land to sea. And what we found is that just 1% of rivers is responsible for almost 80% of all the plastic going to the ocean. So if we stop the plastic there, we have a really good shot, I think, at rapidly stopping more plastic from going to the ocean. So with our interceptors, which we put into the mouth of the, the heaviest polluting rivers in the world. We hope to catch the plastic before it becomes ocean plastic. Now, 1% of rivers sounds easy. In a way, it's, it's good news, but on the other hand, it's still a thousand rivers. So that's a large number. And we want to do this in a matter of years. So, of course, on one hand, it's really important that we have solutions that are scalable, that we can just build many of in, in, in series. Of course, that's what's really ingrained in the philosophy of these interceptors. But at the same time, we've also come to learn that every river is different. As one of my colleagues always likes to say, if you've seen one river, you've seen one river. If you think about things like uh, tidal differences, uh, current speeds, the width of rivers, uh, the depth, uh, are there vessels or not? Uh, what kind of vessel traffic? Uh, do you have water hyacinths, so these green plants like you see in this river or not? So there's all these different variables. And ultimately, if we want to be effective at closing the tap, we need to always be able to have an effective solution for every one of these 1,000 rivers. We need to have the right solution for the right river. And that's why we have this portfolio of different kinds of interceptors, where we can always choose the right solution for each of these different set of circumstances. So besides the interceptor original, we also have the interceptor barriers combined with an interceptor tender, which is a mobile solution so you can serve as different rivers. It's for any river, for any country where we need to deploy, we need to set up consortia of, of partners to, to make this a success. So you need the government relations in terms of permitting, etc. You need an operator to, to run these machines. You need uh, a waste management partner to make sure that the waste collected is properly disposed of. So you kind of have this sort of network of, uh, of partners um, around it. So helping to sort of create a buzz in a country, help to secure you know, the right partners, I think that can tremendously accelerate that process yeah, to, to really deploy interceptors at a, at a high rate. When I look at our team, I see a group of people that 
is extremely dedicated and has this mindset of, okay, we might not have figured everything out, but we'll find out along the way. We'll, we'll learn by doing, because ultimately, these things may be difficult, but the ocean doesn't care whether we find it difficult. You know, this needs to be done, and eventually we'll find a way. Great, thank you. So we're all, we're all back. Okay. So the ocean cleanup, as you can see, you know, there's a lot of work that's being done and um, the leader of the ocean cleanup is um, Boyan Slat. And like you see, I can see he's created this fantastic interceptor. So what they're doing is that they're, they're being reactive. You know, they can see the problem and they've created this, this fantastic interceptor, which is ridding the, um, the waters, the river and the oceans off, um, off, these, off the plastic. And you can see they, they had the nets around the mouth of the river, so before you kind of reach the ocean, but they're also doing massive cleanups um, in the ocean as well, which you probably heard of the, um, the Great Pacific Garbage um, Patch as well. So like I said, they're reacting to the waste already in the ocean, but we need to find a way to close the tap to plastic pollution. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. So even if you live hundreds of miles away from the coast, the plastic you throw away can still make its way into the sea. And this is a really fantastic um, diagram that you can see on your screen right now. Um, fantastic research has been made by a company called Unomia. And they can see here where different types of plastics, where it derives from, and the quantities of it is in, in the water, how much is actually on the seabed, on the top level. Um, it's a fantastic, um, it's a fantastic um, infographic this is. So like I said, even if you live hundreds of miles away from the coast, the plastic you threw, throw away could still make its way to the sea. And once the plastic is in the ocean, it does decompose very slowly, breaking into very tiny pieces known as microplastics, which can then enter the marine food chain and become incredibly damaging to sea life. Now, the main source of plastic pollution is land-based, as you can see. And like we've said before, 80% of plastic in the ocean originates from the land. Now, the main sources of um, plastic debris found in the ocean are land-based. It's coming from urban and storm runoff, so our overflows, littering, inadequate waste disposal and management, industrial activities, even tire abrasion, and also illegal dumping. Ocean-based plastic originates primarily from the fishing industry and also nautical activities. So that's ocean-based plastic, which obviously is different from land-based plastic. But you can see all the percentages there. Under the influence also of solar UV radiation or wind currents and other natural factors, what happens is that that plastic that is in the water then breaks down further into very much smaller plastics called microplastics. And microplastics tend to be smaller than five millimeters, which is probably like the size of like your, your, your thumbnail or even further nanoplastics. And the smaller the size, the easier it makes it easier for marine life to ingest them accidentally. Now it's said that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So um, that's quite a big, um, that's quite a big stat actually, and it's quite an incredible stat. Um, and I, I, I can't help but share that and please share that widely as well across your social media networks. So many countries lack the infrastructure to prevent plastic, um, um, plastic pollution. And like I said, this does lead to plastic leakage in rivers and oceans. And the global illegal trade of plastic waste can also damage the ecosystems as well. So there are three main ways of how plastic ends up in the ocean. And if we know, if we know how it ends up, then surely we can find a solution. So the three main ways and plastic does end up in the oceans is um, throwing plastic in the bin when it could be recycled, when rubbish is being transported in different disposal routes, not just, I'm not talking about this country elsewhere, you know, it can get blown um, and it can, because it's lightweight, and also from there, you can eventually clutter around drains and rivers and, and see in this way. Littering is a major problem. Litter dropped on the street 
does not stay there. Rainwater and the wind, it can carry the, the litter or the plastic waste into the streams and rivers and through the drains. So if the film Finding Nemo taught us anything, it's that, that all drains lead to the ocean. And lastly, products that go down the drain. Now, many of the products that we use daily are flushed down the toilet. And what are they? They could be wet wipes, um, cotton buds, sanitary products. And the microfibers are even released into the waterways when we wash our clothes in the washing machine. And they're even too small to be filtered out by wastewater plants and they end up being consumed by small marine species. And they end up being in our food chain. Um, there's some fantastic re research which is, which is happening at the moment. Um, I can't even name the person at the moment or the group, but they even found plastic in human blood. So it's still a very emerging, um, a very emerging subject and a lot of research is still being, being made. But a positive move has happened um, in recent years, and that was a ban of the microbeads in, um, in cosmetics, in cleaning products. And that was introduced by the UK government so that these small, small plastic beads will no longer get washed um, down the sink and into our oceans. But there are many more items that can still contribute to this problem. And here is just, you know, this is just, a, 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 again, a, an idea of the kind of impact that it has on marine ecosystems. So the most visible impacts of plastic debris are the ingestion, suffocation, entanglement of hundreds of marine species, as you can see here. Marine wildlife, not only just fish, but also seabirds and whales and turtles, they mistake these plastic for prey, and most of them die of starvation, or their stomachs become filtered with plastics, and they can suffer from all sorts of things like lacerations, infections, reduced ability to swim, injuries. Um, floating plastics also help transport invasive marine species as well, which then threatens our marine biodiversity and the, and the food web as well. So the impacts on human health, um, like I said, you know, there was a research that's been made about, about um, plastic being found in human blood, but also plastics, microplastics um, have been found in tap water, in beer, uh, in salt, um, and they're also present in samples collected in the world's oceans, including the Arctic. Now, several chemicals are used in the production of plastic materials, which are known to be carcinogenic, and they can interfere with the body's um, endocrine system, causing all sorts of um, neurological, reproductive, or developmental, or immune disorders as well, in both humans and wildlife. Um, like I said, um, this more research needs to be made, but it is, we understand it is a wide, a widespread um, problem as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot more that I can say, um, but I can tell you about this other research that just happened recently. And it was research that was conducted by Greenpeace and they surveyed, they surveyed 17, 13, sorry, 13 rivers for plastics. And they found that a quarter of fish in the Thames as estuary um, were eating plastics. And obviously this can have very devastating repercussions for the ecosystems in the rivers. And another research was conducted was in the River Mersey, which is quite a large river in the, in the UK. And they found that they collected 800 particles of plastic in just 30 minutes. So some of these areas, you know, from our human eye, you know, it looks absolutely beautiful, absolutely stunning, but there is a hidden pollution that we can't see. Also, there's impacts on food and human health. Plastic waste damages the aesthetic value of tourist um, destinations. It leads to decreased income from tourism. Um, for example, you know, you go to a beach, uh, you know, you, you, you go to, you go, you go on holiday somewhere and you sit on a beach and you see all this plastic around you. Believe me, you're not going to go there again and you're going to tell 10 other people not to go there either. So it does have some devastating impact on the country's economy as well as the wildlife and also the physical and psychological well-being of people, which Emily mentioned before in terms of like the benefits of why 
um, rivers are important. You know, we go by we go by the countryside or by the river because it does something for our well-being, increases our well-being. So we do need to turn the tide on plastic pollution and we do need to take action. So what is that? Well, I'd like to introduce you to the waste hierarchy. So whenever I go out and buy anything, in my head, I've got the waste hierarchy going. Um, I go through this. And this ranks, this waste hierarchy ranks waste management options according to the best for the environment. Um, the waste hierarchy is in our legislation of waste regulations 2011, and it gives top priority to preventing waste in the first place. And as you can see here, we need to reduce it, then we reuse it, repair, recycle, and the last two is obviously recover and, dispo and disposal. And I'll give you an example of a plastic bottle in terms of, right, just a simple bottle, you know, what should be coming through our, through our head? Do we go out and buy a water bottle? No, we can reuse a buy a refillable and reuse that and it just goes on like that so wait the waste hierarchy is a mindset it has to be action at the point of shopping um, and the things that we need to question is firstly do I need it or do I want it there's a difference between needing and wanting and like I said can it be reused repaired recycled and the last resort is disposal so we need to say no to single use plastics. Um, we can see here that single use plastics account for 40% of the plastic produced every year. Plastic items such as plastic bags, food wrappers, all, the, all of these things are used for me, mere minutes or hours and yet they stick around for 500 or more years. I mean, I for one have made some drastic changes, like we can all save a lot of raw finite resources by opting and carrying a reusable bag, which I have here, um, a reusable drinks bottle, which I have here. And you know what's gonna come next? Yes, a Veolia branded reusable <laughs> keep cup for all you teas, tea and drink, uh, uh, coffee, and, uh, coffee and tea drinkers. So keep these items at your, um, disposal, keep them near you, either in your car, in your handbag, if you know you're going to be traveling out, just keep them near you so you don't have to um, buy anything like that. Also, we need to raise a glass to the refillables. Um, find out where your nearest refill shop is and your household lotions and potions can all be taken care of. Um, this is a photograph that I took just last week. This is a refillable shop um, in Hertfordshire and um, I went there just to refill my washing up liquid and a few other items there. So um, in particular, Veolia have this amazing sustainability fund and it does actually provide funding for, um, for not-for-profit organisations or community groups if you want to try to deal with the plastic problem or if you have any other solutions to um, any, any sustainability solutions um, to transform your local community or environment. So like I said, a money is available, especially in, in Watford and elsewhere. So a successful project can provide evidence of any of those things that you can read um, from the slide here, anything, anything which enhances biodiversity um, and protects our or preserves our resources and the environment. Another thing that we can all do is, is litter pick take part in litter picks. So I want to now introduce you to a lady, a fabulous lady that I met a couple of years ago. Her name is Angela Keane. She is a local paddle boarder in Watford. And I met her at the Great British Spring Clean, which, are, which is a Keep Britain Tidy um, uh, event. Um, and it happens every year. And she chose to litter pick on her paddle board. Um, Angela is actually a, a swimmer, swimming teacher. And she also swim outdoors, which is why a really good reason why we need to keep the clean uh, the waters clean. So I'd like to now introduce um, 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 Angela. So hello, Hi. Angela. Hello, Angela. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions because, like I said, I met you um, a couple of years ago now. So why do you litter pick, especially on the paddleboard? What, what's what's motivated you to do to do that? What um, motivated me initially was social media. I wanted to do something that was engaging on social media. So it was quite selfish at the beginning. Um, and this picture shows my first litter pick and we got seven bags of rubbish, which was quite a lot. And I really, really hated it. It was smelly. The things that I found were disgusting. 
Um, and I brought all the stuff back to you and I said, I'm never doing this again. And you said you will. <laughs> and I go quite regularly now. I, I realize like you don't need to go and collect seven bags every time. Just take one bag and get a few bits and pieces and then you've done your bit. So um, I just combine it with meeting friends, having a bit of a workout um, and just mm -hmm. you know feeling good that I've done something. Yeah, I, I still remember that day and and you, you were just covered in the stench as well, weren't you? You were really self-conscious. I, I, I couldn't smell it. I couldn't smell it, but you you were just very um, traumatised after that. So what items have you seen in the water? Because I know since then you've done quite a few of these litter picks on, on um, that was actually the, the Grand Union Canal. So what have you seen in the water? Anything which has alarmed you at all? Um, the majority of things that we find are uh, the single-use items that you said before, so drinks, bottles, crisps, um, sweets, coffee cups, things like that, all things that really just we don't need. If you take your own food and drink out and your own refillable bottles, you just you, there would be nothing to throw away. So that's what most of that stuff was. Um, but occasionally we found some odd things, like I saw a TV in the water, um, couldn't quite get that out on that occasion. Um, I've seen people's shoes, some clothes and things like that and just think who left them there, why? Hmm, yeah. So Emily, uh, sorry, Emily, Angela, so what, what from your opinion, like after you did these litter picks, have you changed anything in your own life since doing those, those litter picks on the water? Any changes that you've made or any messages that you'd like to give to our audience here today? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is it's made me really think about what I'm taking with me and what I'm what I'm disposing of and how and I think like most people if you go along somewhere and you've eaten something and you've got a messy wrapper with you and there's no bin you don't want to put it in your pocket you don't want to put it in your bag what do you do with it you can see how tempting it would be to just drop it and say didn't see it you know whoops it came out of my hand but now I would never do that and just thinking about, do I need to take it with me? Is there something else I can take? Can I take a rubbish bag with me and dispose of it later? Thank you so much, Angela. I really appreciate you coming on um, a very short notice as well. And thank you for sharing your um, pearls of wisdom and, and please do continue. You're doing fantastic work. Hats off thank to you. you. Thank you so much. So you can you heard from Angela right there, but um, there's also other things that you can do. So, you, like I said, that litter picks are very important. They just does, they don't have to be on on water. They can be on on land as well. <laughs> um, so you can contact your your local council who have litter pick kits. I know in Watford we do. We earlier we do loan out litter pick kits. So you can very easily borrow it free of charge from us and we will also lend you the litter pick uh, sticks and also the bags and we'll even collect the, the bags from you if you tell us where they are kept. And this goes very nicely to um, our, uh, our more or less last slide, which is you can take part in a, in, in, in a litter pick. So we have a litter pick which is organized by Friends of Oxy Park. I think Sandy is on this call today. He's the chair of Friends of Oxy Park. So we have a litter pick organized in Oxy Park. And funnily enough, we have the River Colne, which runs um, through Oxy Park. And that's on Saturday, the 11th of June, 10.30 to 12.30. And uh, this is in Watford. Um, the meeting point is opposite the Tasty Bean Cafe by by the bridge. And you can also follow the Friends of Oxy Park on their Facebook page as well. So thank you very much. Um, I know that was a bit of a whirlwind, but I hope that um, gave you something to think about. And um, yeah, again, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And um, both Emily and I, happy to take any questions that you may have. And again, you can use a chat facility for that. So if you don't have any questions now, please feel free to send me an email. Um, if you think of anything afterwards, um, I can get and then I can get an answer to you. Um, but Yep, thank you, Sheila, for that brilliant presentation. I think it was really informative, really interesting from start to finish how the rubbish starts in the rivers and ends up in the sea. I think that's um, 
it was very good. Um, so Sand has asked, all bin waste and parts goes to landfill, what can we do about this? Um, yes, it does. Um, I know in some parks uh, around Watford, they do have the dual um, bins, which is one side is a litter bin and the other side is recycling. So when you do see that, ensure that you put your recyclable waste in, in the right compartment of that particular bin. Um, I know when we're doing litter picks, we do also give clear bags where you can dispose of um, plastic bottles and cans. We, 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 we definitely say don't touch any broken glass only because for health and safety, but you can just report that into your local council and they will collect it um, as soon as possible. Hope that's okay, Sandy. Um, somebody mentioned about the microplastics um, found in the human blood. Um, I can I actually follow the, this, this particular group on Twitter. So I'm just frantically going on Twitter right now <laughs> to see, <laughs> to, tell you the, uh, to tell you who they are. But otherwise I can pass that over to Emily. Um, you can direct message Emily. Uh, I think this is coming from Gemma. So if you want to direct message um, Emily, your email address or something, and then she can pass that over to you. So yeah, I can get that, I can get that for you, no problem whatsoever. Um, also, Romy has put into the chat function, if you're interested in holding your own litter pick, uh, please email inquiries.watford at viola.co.uk. Um, I will also add that email address into the follow-up email after this event, so you can access that and give them an email. Um, so Martin has said, not all waste goes to landfill. Some are sent to an energy recovery facility where it's burned with to create energy uh, with controlled emissions, which are much lower than fossil fuel energy production. Um, yeah, that's correct, yeah. And someone has posted a Guardian article about um, microplastics found in human blood, which I think is quite recent as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. So if there aren't any more questions, um, so there will be a follow up email um, with all the links and email addresses for you to contact about doing any other um, litter picks. And um, we do have a, another webinar next week um, that is presented by uh, Dr. Rosemary Perkins from the University of Sussex. And that is about pet medicines um, impact in rivers. So flea and worm treatment and how that might impact rivers and local wildlife. I'll put a link in the email for you to sign up to that next week. So that's next Tuesday, uh, 12 to 1 p.m. Oh, and a final question. Dog waste is put into park bins so it can't then be recycled. Should we address this? Um, yeah, I think I think dog waste is might be treated in a different way. I'm not entirely too sure. Um, so that's being put. Yeah, okay. So I think Keep Britain Tidy. They um, they had this whole campaign of poo can go actually into into the normal litter bins. Um, and again, I think probably what we need is we need to capture, we probably need to capture more recyclables. So by having these different types of dual bins, and again, like I said, I urge you to use the different dual bins to make sure that your recycling is, is captured. But yeah, you're right, dog waste is, is put into park bins. And Mud made a good point that you can buy biodegradable poo bags as well, so. Yeah, and I think also, um, Angela, when I spoke to you yesterday, you mentioned that there was like a huge issue when you were paddleboarding, that there was a lot of dog poo bags, wasn't there? Yeah, it was, uh, it just seemed a shame to put it in a bag and leave it on the side where it's not going to break down. You know, either put it in a bin or leave it uncovered so that it can rot away. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I believe it's one minute past two, so I don't want to take any more of your time. So I really, I really appreciate all of you being here and taking your time out during your lunch time. And, um, and anything that you've learned here, I always say this, please, please share it. Anything that you found quite interesting, please tell another 10 people at least or, or on your social media. Um, but we do need to 
turn the tide on plastic pollution. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for joining everyone. Um, have a lovely weekend. <laughs>